Welcome to a great crowd of friends and family and supporters of Rebecca Oni, who are here tonight to honor for the 2012 Gleitzman Citizen Activist Award. <laughs> Cody and I have the good fortune of leading the Gleitzman Program in Leadership for Social Change at the Center for Public Leadership. Welcome to one of my favorite days of the year. Today, we are charged with continuing the efforts of Alan Gleitzman and Sherry Roche, two great visionaries who recognized that the power of their work could have a lasting impact on learning at Harvard. The Gleitzman Activist Award in even years is given to a citizen domestic activist, and in odd years is given to an international activist. It was started more than 20 years ago by Alan Gleitzman, a Cornell alum, an Air Force veteran, and his life partner, Sherry Roche. Alan, a retired television executive, had sold his extensive holdings of films and television shows, including Speed Racer, Felix the Cat, and The Count of Monte Cristo, and turned the proceeds into his retirement gig as the Gleitzman Foundation which sought to encourage leadership and social activism worldwide. The foundation presented these annual awards to, to, as Alan had told the LA Times in 1991, to recognize people who make a difference, tell their story, and make other people aware of what one person can do. Early winners of the award included Ralph Nader, Wendy Kopp, in 1994, only three years after she launched Teach for America, and Nelson Mandela. Alan and Sherry also managed to recruit judges like Desmond Tutu, Shimon Perez, and Gloria Steinem. Finally, Alan enlisted Maya Lin, the designer of the, the National Vietnam Veterans Memorial, to design this beautiful sculpture in front of us, which will be presented later this evening. Alan and Sherry decided that the immense teaching value of this award program needed an academic home. As a result, he established a generous bequest to the Center for Public Leadership and the Kennedy School that has enabled us to continue his legacy of this award program and to share the wisdom of our winners with this community. CPL also welcomed a cohort of accomplished social activist Kennedy School students each year, our Gleitzman Leadership Fellows, some of whom are here tonight. We also offer additional learning opportunities in this space for students, including the Gleitzman Social Change Film Forum, Gleitzman Visiting Practitioners, to help students across the university with inspirational social innovators through student-moderated conversations, study groups, lectures, and other networking opportunities. I mentioned that this is one of my favorite days of the year. The other day is the day when I get to call our Gleitzman Award winner. <laughs> We've called satellite phones in sub-Saharan Africa and Afghanistan, and once had a winner cry hard enough that she needed to call us back. <laughs> Our call to Rebecca was noteworthy because she used the word, wow, a lot. <laughs> I'll say that we're wowed by Rebecca and by the team that she's built, and are very fortunate to have an opportunity to share Alan's legacy with you tonight. I know that he would be eager to participate in this event and to honor Rebecca as well. For me, one of the most powerful aspects of Rebecca's work is a simple one, that she came out of the Harvard community and began her journey as an activist by merely heading down Mass Ave to Boston Medical Center. I spent a lot of time trying to encourage our students to think locally, and that has just been a very compelling part of your story, Rebecca. I'm also blown away by her humility and by how much her success has come from listening. Much has transpired since she began Project Health during her sophomore year at Harvard College. Professor Mary Ruggie will help us better understand Rebecca and her impact on thousands of patients, on the thousands of people who have viewed her April 2012 talk at TED Med, and on the thousands of Project Health and Health Leads college volunteers who will be the next generation of healthcare leaders. Many thanks to the following partner groups for organizing events to help us welcome Rebecca to Harvard, including the Center for Public Leadership Student Advisory Board and the Harvard Latino Student Alliance. Thanks also to the CPL team, including Mike Leveriza, who runs the Gleisman Award process, and would like me to remind you that very soon we'll be accepting nominations for the 2013 International Activist Award. Most importantly, let me introduce and thank our moderator, Professor Mary Ruggie, for helping us lead this conversation. She's an adjunct professor of public policy at HKS and at the college and teaches courses on comparative health policy, 
focusing on Western Europe, inequalities in healthcare, and gender and health. Joining her tonight will be Rebecca, obviously, and also two of her volunteers, or recent or alums of the volunteer program for Project Health or Healthy. Um, Kelsey Nasahara, who's Harvard College class of 2013, and Jay Miller, who's Harvard class of 2009 and is currently enrolled at the Harvard Medical School. Let's welcome our panel. We hope that you have come ready with questions. And when the panel concludes, we'll have a Q&A, we'll have a mic stand that will move to the middle so that you can share your questions as well with our panel. And then at the conclusion of the panel, uh, Ambassador Swanee Hunt will come, will be here as well to present, uh, present Rebecca with the award. So thanks to our panel. Congratulations. <laughs> Harvard, um, 
ended up um, concentrating in history and science, and um, which is an interdisciplinary undergraduate major, and again, had one of these really, I think, um, trajectory conversation, uh, changing conversations with Ellen Brandt, who ended up being my thesis advisor and as a professor in history and science, where we were talking about bioethics and my aspirations around going into bioethics, and he said, you know, the thing about bioethics is that it's just sort of philosophical. History is how decisions are made. And um, I thought that was really, to me, I think he helped sort of evolve my thinking from, you know, it's not just about what we might do, but what we choose to do. Um, and, in, and I think in many ways, Kelsey was born into those conversations. Well, so, well what's important um, also is that you inspired uh, these young people and uh, just a whole lot of others. Um, and so, you know, but I was kind of wondering, um, you could have done so much with your activism, you could have just gone out there in the community, but you decided to do something with students and student volunteers, and uh, so I'm wondering why you decided that model in particular? Uh, what was it about the student volunteer um, that, that was important to you? So I think there's a few uh, pieces to it. So I think one was, as a college student, as a freshman in college, having this transformative experience working um, with Jack in legal services and just having you know, dozens of conversations with low-income families in Boston who were making very acute trade-offs between um, doing what they needed to to be helping and doing what they needed to in order to live. Um, but what's, I think, profound about that experience for me was the trust that Jeff um, gave me to be a champion and advocate at, you know, like really as a freshman in college, not really knowing at all what I was doing, and um, my seeing the impact of that. And, um, and it, you know, I, I distinctly sort of remember um, the decision points around sort of what it meant to move from my, I think to your question, directly being an advocate for the families that I was working with to trying to mobilize other people to do it, and some of the discomfort I felt around that, especially because it was going to be mobilizing Harvard students, right, which seems, you know, a bit luxurious <laughs> in the scheme of things. Um, and um, I had this, you know, really, I think, again, significant conversation with, with Jeff, um, this attorney who I was working with, where I sort of shared this notion that you know, if, if this experience at legal services had been so transformative for me, what would it mean to try to replicate it for, you know, at that time, dozens of other people? Um, and I had this conversation with him where, you know, I was kind of looking for his blessing to move from being an advocate for individual families to, you know, sort of being a, a sort of catalyst for other students and, you know, thought that I, could, you know, I best just get his approval for what I was doing, but had this conversation where I, again, I'll never forget the conference room we were in and the table we sat at, and um, you know, he said, when you have a vision, Rebecca, you have an obligation to realize that vision, um, which was just so much more than I actually wanted him to say. <laughs> um, and um, I remember actually like my stomach sort of sinking in that moment, um, but feeling like, you know, okay, then that really does mean that it's about how do you mobilize others around this vision. So there's something <laughs> about mobilizing um, people to sort of go and march in the streets and so on, and mobilizing people to work on an individual basis with individual families. And, you know, I think power students are, are absolutely wonderful. They know an awful lot. But there's a kind of a match problem. Um, they need to be trained um, about how to work with, with individual families. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, about that, that training. But at the same time, um, as you begin to put the young people in the community, then you begin to see that there's sort of a supply-demand problem because you've got a lot of good volunteers, that, but they need to be trained. But at the same time, you begin to see that there is a, probably an immense need and you don't have enough uh, of these young volunteers. So how did you do all this matching? Um, that you can go on first with the training and then you know with meeting the kind of need um, that's out there. Yeah, I can um, I can speak to that a bit and then and then I'd like yeah. to too. Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 and then they can get the real answer to that. <laughs> um, so on the training piece, I think that you know part of the premise of Health Leads and it goes to your workforce question is you know the conversations that I had with physicians at 
um, you know, then Boston City Hospital, the thing that they kept talking about was time, right? That there was just this desperate need for additional time to be able to engage patients around their real health needs and then to actually do something about that. And, um, you know, and so part of the, the question was, what are, you know, Training, I think, is a piece of it, but part of it is just what are the what are the core assets that our advocates and college students bring to the work and to show up with, right? And time is a huge asset, um, but also, you know, if we do our recruitment right, just profound tenacity, right? This unwillingness to take no for an answer, I think, is critical. You know, real technological savvy, which is critical when you think about data collection. Um, which is a, a key part of our model. And also, I think just this um, just authentic appetite to build relationships with the patients and, and again, the time to allow them to do that. So then the idea is to say, okay, how do we, to the greatest extent possible, leverage those assets, but also bring to bear some of the, some of the training. And so you know, all of the advocates go through between three to 18, 13 to 18 hours of training before they set foot in the clinic. But part of the model, even from like the very first day was this notion of these reflection sessions on campus and an intentional opportunity to be able to bring folks together to talk about the work and also continue doing the learning and training over time. But, so, you know, so, so Jay, uh, Jay, why don't you tell everybody who you are, um, uh, when you started this, and, and why, uh, and also then how you feel about the student volunteer sure. model. Sure. I'm Jay Miller. I uh, started HealthPace back in I guess, 2006, which I'm starting to feel like an increasingly long time ago. <laughs> I was a, a sophomore at Harvard and was looking for a way to sort of engage with this idea of the social determinants of health or something I've gotten, gotten increasingly excited about in the classroom. and stumbled across what was then Project Health, and started off as a volunteer on, uh, at Boston Medical Center in pediatrics, and then became a program coordinator, and then eventually a campus coordinator and a, a board member with Project Health. So I've been lucky enough to see the organization from sort of a range of perspectives, and uh, graduated from college in 2009, and then spent some time uh, abroad in Uganda and then London, and came back to Boston for medical school. So I think I'll, on this topic of sort of of engaging volunteers and of, of training. I think one case you mentioned that activism is often thought of as sort of getting people out into the streets and a certain sort of combative aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think there are important injustices within the American healthcare system, but a lot of what I see Health Leagues doing is more a collaborative kind of activism. As Rebecca was mentioning, I think doctors very much want to address these needs and the challenge is having the time to address all the problems that their patients have. And so I think Healthy can be very much part of that team, not really working as a combative type of activist, but as a, as a collaborator in the healthcare team and allowing physicians to do what they do best and then addressing the needs like housing, food, job training, education that aren't really best addressed by physicians in their limited time. And I think undergrads have, have time and have the passion to, to work with families uh, you know, for 45 minutes for an hour where the doctor just wouldn't have that time to sit there and fill out a food stamp application or fill out a subsidized housing application. So I see, I see that as a real strength of the, the volunteer model. And Kelsey, tell us please who you are and how you got into it. <laughs> um, my name is Kelsey Nakahara. I'm a senior at the college. I'm studying human developmental and regenerative biology. Um, I know it's a mouthful of so many words. Um, and I got involved with Health Leaves as a freshman, actually. It was the very first thing I joined at Harvard, my freshman fall. Um, and I was really interested in this idea that we got to be in the clinic and was really a part of the healthcare system. And I think that's what's really unique about Health Leaves is that, you know, Jay mentioned that, you know, activism is often thought of as a grassroots type of movement, but Health Leaves really puts volunteers in the system with, that they want to change. And you're working hand in hand with doctors to change that. And not only are you making their lives easier by addressing these things that you have the time and the creativity to address, which I think is one of the biggest strengths of college students is that, you know, maybe maybe we're a little too over eager and not jaded enough. <laughs> but <laughs> we come at, you know, these situations we see with our with the clients we meet and the families and there's just a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of determination to attack problems creatively, whether that's a whole lot of Google searching or brainstorming with your client or whatever that is. And I think those actions really indelibly impact 
whatever career path um, the volunteers are on. And many people like me are interested in medicine, as well as Jay. But there are so many other students within HealthLeaf that are interested in law or policy or completely unre seemingly unrelated to HealthLeaf. But I think that this experience of working with a population of people who we might not ever otherwise meet being Harvard students is really impactful on how we think about the world and how we think about how these problems can be addressed. So I want to try to uh, push a little bit further on you know, what you've been expressing, which is you as a link between family um, and, and the healthcare system. Um, did you find that you were able to, you know, be able to sort of go back and forth um, uh, in any way, talking, you know, with physicians and, and nurses and others? Um, primarily just working with the families on their on their basic needs and, and one of the reasons I asked that um, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to hear um, you saying that you think that the field of, of, of being a doctor is changing um, I think it is too um, and I think um, the, uh, the way the Affordable Care Act is approaching these kinds of change is something that's very important there are is a lot of funding for community health clinics um, for the word patient-centered care is just throughout that legislation. The idea of a medical home, you know, is something that's very important. So, in in on paper, it looks as though the healthcare system potentially can change. But you know, you're, you are seeing it. You in the past are, uh, thought one way, the way healthy is now. Now you're seeing it in a different way. I'll ask you about that later. Um, but um, you know. How, how are you feeling about the fact that there is still health care system of doctors, families there, you being the one to try to link it, uh, link them together, and all sorts of changes that are, are going on? Would you like, do you want to start with that? Healthy sure. The one that's sort of <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I mentioned that I felt like we were very much a part of the yeah, healthcare system. Yeah. And one of the reasons that we were very fortunate, I also worked at the pediatric clinic of the Boston Medical Center. Um, which was you know, the very first desk of Project Health. Mm -hmm. And so we have been fortunate enough to be integrated into the electronic medical record system. And so really, doctors can refer their patients to us as they would to any other type of medical provider, which I think really speaks volumes to how much our work is valued in the clinic. And so in that way, we're able to communicate back and forth with doctors um, about, you know, we sent your patient to a food stamp pantry. And so sometimes they'll leave us notes, we leave them notes, um, and what is the experience that you had when you were both a volunteer, but also a little bit now um, uh, as a medical student, school student, is that sort of a world that you're leaving behind as you're learning about science? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I think that I, I just, I'm a second year student now, so I spend fairly limited time in the hospital, although fortunately that will be changing in a few short months. But I think even in the afternoons that I am in the hospital, we see exactly the same needs that I saw at the Health Week volunteer. Particularly this year, I'm at the Cambridge Hospital, which is one of the few remaining public hospitals in, in Massachusetts. And so uh, the patients have very complex needs, both social needs as well as just complex medical needs. And I think that it, as, a, as a primary care physician in the future, I would very much hope to practice in a clinic where there was something available like Health Week because I think it'd be incredibly frustrating to know that your patients you know, didn't have enough to eat or didn't have uh, didn't have somewhere safe to live and not really be able to change that. And so you would know that that was what was really driving their health. And you're doing your best, but you're not really accomplishing what you could accomplish if those needs were addressed. So I think it's very much, but hopefully where the American system is, is going, particularly with your mentioning the Affordable Care Act and some of the financing changes and, uh, some of what we're seeing with more, what used to be called like bundle payments now with accountable care organizations, I think will give uh, hospitals or healthcare systems a very strong incentive to address these kinds of issues like food and housing because if you're trying to prevent readmission, then that's probably a great way to do it. And so I think that'll create a great a great demand for the services and programs like HealthLeads and hopefully a great way for us to, to grow and become engaged even more throughout the healthcare system. I'd like to ask you what you think about now the sorts of changes um, mm -hmm. uh, that are going on. You know, those that are uh, hopefully being um, propelled by the uh, ACA, 
um, but also, you know, where health leads might fit into this. And at the same time, if health leads is going to be fitting into this, is health leads changing um, at all? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so I think what I would say is that I think part of the shifts in the healthcare landscape are, of course, inevitably um, tied to the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I would say, um, among other things, probably most relevant to us is the huge expansion of Medicaid coverage um, to about 16 to 18 million um, additional folks. And so, you know, because that's healthly is target population, what that means to us is that, you know, literally millions more people will be able to use the healthcare system um, if we do our work well as a gateway to then get connected out to the resources that they need to be healthy. Um, so I think, but I think what's in some ways almost more interesting is the market shifts that are happening separate from the Affordable Care Act. And so I think the, the evolution, um, as Jay was saying, sort of away from a fee-for-service model for, you know, that, that functionally rewards bad health outcomes, right? That, that rewards emergency department visits and hospital admissions um, to one that, you know, really monetizes the value of um, improving health outcomes and ideally ensuring that folks um, stay out of the ER, stay out of the hospital. And I think, so I, I think what's fascinating about the market shift is that it's, it's actually not a political event. It's, it's the market beginning to evolve in the face of escalating healthcare costs and the opportunity that, that that creates. And I think your question about what that means for health leads, I think is really, is exactly right. And I think health leads um, ourselves, even before the ACA went into effect, um, about three years ago, really recognized that if we were gonna achieve the kind of systemic change that we wanted in healthcare, we were gonna need to be able to evolve health leads from a sort of nice to have program, like it's so great that our patients have access to these resources, to a need to have, right? Something that was integral to the way healthcare is delivered, that the providers rely upon it, that the you know, institutions make financial investments in it, and what we could not have anticipated at the time is the market shift that would facilitate that evolution. Um, and you know, again, you know, as healthcare providers become responsible for improving the health of their patients, we are getting these really funny phone calls from institutions that literally would not talk to us a couple of years ago. You know, saying, "Well, you know, now that Medicare won't reimburse us for hospital admissions within 30 days of discharge." Like it turns out, we should actually care about where our patients are being discharged to and whether they have access to healthy food. And we got in like literally that phone call um, saying, can we revisit our conversations? Um, so I think that's a huge piece of it. The final thing I'll say, because I think it's easy to focus just on the financial senses, but particularly given the nature of the Gleisman Award, I think one of the, one of the most interesting evolutions in the sector that's underway is around the kind of leadership that is expected. Um, and I think this move from sort of healthcare leadership just being something that happens at an institutional level, you're the CEO of the hospital, you're the chief medical officer, to you know, as as the expectations of frontline providers and in particular primary care physicians really gets elevated and rewarded, the imperative for those frontline doctors, nurses, and others to have the kind of leadership skills required to bring together a team around the care of patients. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things is just, you know, I think Health Leads has always been invested in the piece of our work that involves the advocates and the impact of Health Leads on their trajectories. But I think what's interesting is now the opportunity to contextualize that piece of work in um, a real imperative that the healthcare system has to be able to, I, to, to have leaders that are used to working on multidisciplinary teams, that are used to talking to patients about a set of issues beyond just their presenting clinical needs. And I think you know, our graduating advocates, like that's just the work they do. Um, and that's, so I think that's a really compelling piece of this equation. I, I, I hope everybody can be taking notes on exactly what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and you know, I'll have it up there because uh, you really, you really, I think, mentioned all of the very important parts. And you know, I'll just, I'll just draw out this idea of, of bringing together different parts of the mm -hmm. system to work as a team. So I'll just ask you very mundanely, um, Jay, in medical school, do you have any experience in working as a team? And as an undergraduate, have you ever had the opportunity to work in a team? So please, first, huh. as an undergraduate, in any of your courses, 
have you or have you seen? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to help, please. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's where you get your teamwork, right? Is through help, um, through the kind of work that you're doing on, uh, uh, yeah. on help. I think that may be a very accurate statement. All right. Well, I think getting Ms. Kelly's point about, you know, well, of course, the doctors just, you know, refer patients to us and we communicate back with the doctors. I mean, that kind of, you know, that sort of it's seamless integration. Exactly. Right? And that the doctor, no, not only know that they can refer, but in referring to you, they have a kind of respect um, for what it is that you are and what it is that you're doing. And that's a, a different aspect of what I think is supposed to be going on with you, so leadership, forming a team, I think that's part of it. Are there any possible courses on teamwork at Harvard Medical School? <laughs> I don't know about courses on team, no. but I think that they actually, we actually, they actually do emphasize teamwork to a substantial amount. And, uh, one way the curriculum is set up is that we have tutorial classes where the group is working together to solve a case, and I think that hopefully we can take that forward when we position. So I'd like to give you all the opportunity to ask questions as well, and um, we know that they are alike, but I'm going to turn mine off.
there would be outside impact associated with that. Um, and so you know, we're thinking about it more as sort of a portfolio-based approach to growth. Um, and at the same time, really grappling with, you know, for the other 490 expansion requests, you know, how does HealthWeed um, respond to those? And, you know, what are the ways in which we can help physician others that are interested in implementing the model to do so without jeopardizing the quality of the product? I think the one of the dangers of a model of HealthWeed is that um, from the outside, it just looks so obvious and so Right? It's like, oh, that's so great. I'd like to be great college kids and they're helping families. And like, of, of course, it makes so much sense that patients have these other resource needs. But the truth is, if you're going to do it well, it's incredibly challenging, right? It's hard to get families the resources, to get the technology right, to figure out what, like, what does success look like. And so, you know, the question about training to really ensure that folks are going to be effective in the clinic. And so I think part of healthy is response around the market demand is to try to play a leadership role around what does it mean to be excellent at the work and to try to help define a set of um, standards in some ways around what it means to do the work well. So, you know, from our perspective, if you're connecting patients to resources, if you're not, you know, clinically integrated in the ways that health is talking about, you know, that's not really fulfilling the, the, what it means to change healthcare delivery. And so, you know, how do we continue to provide leadership um, in that way? I'm just curious if you share with us what kind, what the quality of an institution is a good fit for helping. We were just talking about this last week, in fact. <laughs> it's a very timely question. So, I mean, we're, we're debating this as a team. Actually, I mean, this is a totally, like, live question that we're debating right now in the organization. But I think probably, uh, in my mind, um, and I won't even pretend to represent the organization on this, because we have other members of our leadership team here. Um, but in my mind, number one is, is, you know, are the institutions ones where other institutions go to learn? Um, and, you know, how do we make sure that health leads, you know, there's a segment, it's part of the beauty of healthcare in some ways is that there are sort of um, institutions that are recognized as, as best in class. And if they can essentially, by incorporating health leads, make um, clear that part of being a best in class healthcare institution is that you address patient resource needs, that has the potential to be really game changing. So I think other key parts of it are you know, health leads committee going forward to only um, growing institutions that are both willing to integrate the model operationally, right, so to make it part of electronic health record, to really build it into the way the clinic functions, but also to pay the cost of the program. Um, and, um, and we've had some success with that, but are looking to build on that going forward. And again, it's not just about health leads own sustainability, but it's about, you know, acknowledgement that healthcare is what's paid for by the healthcare system. And until we change what the system is paying for, and hopefully we help these to be able to do that, we're not going to get as part of the system. You know, and then of course other qualities around institutional leadership and others. But feel free to you know weigh in. Great. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
and things like that. Um, I think my experience with HealthWays has been incredibly formative in seeing the challenges we talk about in the classroom and seeing, you know, we talk about Medicare and Medicaid and what that looks like to be food insecure and how that affects a child's education potential, the rest of their health care and things like that. Since we've worked with a patient and seen that mother who has their child that doesn't have enough food to eat or worked with someone who peaked and comes not in the middle of the winter and has an asthmatic child with them, you don't really fully understand that and you understand how pervasive that is in our system and, and also how easy it could be to change. And I think one of the things I've learned most from health ways is that even though we have, you know, a, a huge number of undergraduates here that are excited and willing to change health and to help connect them with resources, the social resource landscape is incredibly challenging. And until that is fixed, there's just kind of a disconnect there. But the great thing about health ways is that now you have this entire population of students that is aware of that and is ready to go out and change that through their future careers. So I think connecting just the realities um, of the healthcare system, of the social resource landscape with the knowledge we've learned in the classroom has been what's been most important. <coughs> sure. Yeah, right, sure. Yeah, I think for me, it's having a few years out of college to sort of reflect on it, health ways was um, really a big part of I think, the way I thought about health and the way I thought about healthcare after college. And, uh, not always in ways that were obvious. I, I spent a year in, in Uganda working on a village health worker program in a rural area after college. And I think a lot of the challenges the patients there faced were actually not all that dissimilar from the challenges my patients face at Boston Medical Center. You know, people had food insecurity, people had housing insecurity, people had trouble affording their medications, people had problems with access to health care. And the solutions were, were a little bit different because it was a different setting, but the overall landscape of the problems is the same. So I think it was it was really formative for me to have seen those challenges firsthand and not just to have learned about them in the classroom, but to really see what the, what those families went through and, and why they faced those, those barriers to accessing food or to taking the medication uh, in a very concrete way. Okay, I think on the institutional question, um, so yeah, part of what's so um, wow about getting this award, um, I actually don't remember using that word at all. <laughs>
Adam, you know, just like, um, you know, we often sort of think about like the advocates as like healthcare troublemakers, um, went to the administration and demanded a one credit course on the health of Baltimore. Because everything else being taught at the School of Public Health was either like, you know, totally um, sort of theoretical or about, frankly, healthcare in other countries, you know, in the developing world. And, um, you know, showed up, kind of expecting that there'd be like 10 students who would um, be interested. 75 students showed up the first day on the class, and it's now like a three credit course that offered fall spring and summer. So, so, I mean, I think that's part of the, you know, when you, you know, part of the reason why this award is just, I think, amazing for us is that we, we, um, think about health needs as movement building, right? And how do you begin to build a movement for a different kind of healthcare system that I think premised on some of the just most basic interactions between the advocates and the patients, but ideally does, you know, um, ultimately fundamentally change the way our partner institutions operate. And to be able to see that happen at a place like Hopkins, right, which so prides itself on the clinical care and the science, you know, the science. Um, is just you know exactly the kind of shift we would aspire to be able to create. Well, speaking of getting the award, um, that will make for a nice segue to the next segment of the program. Right? I think that's good. All right. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank with Professor Mary Ruggie and to our panelists. And um, in, uh, to conclude this evening, I would love to welcome Ambassador Samani Hunt um, to the front, who incredibly wears a lot of hats and always happens to have some really incredible personal connection to our winners. Uh, Ambassador Hunt happens to be a, a faculty member uh, who's affiliated with the Center for Public Leadership as an occasional actual judge of the Weizmann Award Program, though not this year. <laughs> um, and also has a, has, a, has a close connection to Rebecca as well, so she will join us to make the actual award presentation. So welcome to Ambassador Hunt. <laughs> When I heard that Rebecca was receiving this award, I called the Center for Public Leadership and I said, please, 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 may I, may I be here this evening? <laughs> may I hand it to her? I mean, she's a hero to me, and that's why you're here too. Uh, and I mean, you all know all of the, you know, MacArthur genius. Like, if you ever sat next to a genius, here's one. <laughs> uh, you can shake her hand later. The uh, John F. Kennedy New Frontier Award. That's a very very big deal. Uh, Forbes Magazine, Impact 30, uh, World Economic Forum, Young Global Leader, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I have had the privilege of being with Rebecca in many settings. And uh, if I could add to this um, tapestry here this evening, you've been talking about your work with Health Leads, and thank you all for, thank you Mary, thank you all for adding to the conversation. Um, I have been with her in a seminar room with a crowd of other social movement leaders who were like big deal leaders. And what I saw when I watched her was this inspiring self-confidence that is that is big enough self-confidence that she could be both their teacher but also their student. That you get what I mean, that it takes a lot of ego to be as accomplished as she is, all the awards that she has, and say, please teach me. And that is something I have learned from you, Rebecca. So thank you for that. I have been with this woman on a hillside at 10,000 feet where you can talk about breathless. Yes, she was breathless. <laughs> we all were breathless uh, at that altitude. But, but it's a setting where you look out 
Oh, guess what? Is it South Park? There actually is a South Park. Oh, my gosh. It just dawned on me. But this, this is the South Park of South Park, actually. It's in Colorado. The South Park cartoon was written by two guys from Denver about where you were looking. But you were seeing the wide open vistas, right? And and to, to just get the sense of the thinking, like, well, yeah, here are the things I'm doing, but what are the possibilities? which is what happens when you're in those settings. And, and to listen to her, thinking, well, here's what now, but wow, what we could. Uh, I, I learned again from watching you, Rebecca. I had been with her at a picnic concert on the Charles River Esplanade. And I have seen her compelled, to use your word, compelled by the complexity of Copeland and the brawn of Brahms. Those of you who, who are drawn to classical music, you know what I mean. It's about all of the ways in which the melody becomes harmony and a new melody is passed on from the oboes back to the cellos and onto the flutes, picked up by the, by the violins. And, and this is a woman, and you see it in her work, this is a woman who sees that complexity. And she's able to follow the lines of the complexity. And I watch her in these different settings, and I think now I am seeing her in one more, and that is receiving an award at Harvard University. And Rebecca, I am so glad to add this one. I did my um, own word cloud. <laughs> well, you wondered what I was doing, there I was doing a word cloud, right. And here's what I came up with. I came up with health and growth, outsized impact, understanding, responsible, care. So you were thinking about her work. Now I'm going to read them again and you think about Rebecca, all right, growth outsized impact, understanding, responsible, care, and yes, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so, my honor, you should walk up here. <laughs> <laughs> my honor is to present this award, and I want you when you think about this, I want you to see this dark, hard piece, okay? This heavy. And I want you to see the light in the center. And I want you to see the clarity in the center. And I want you to think that this is how others regard, yes, your work, but much more than that. This is how others see you, Rebecca Oni, as the light in their dark and hard world. who have, in some ways, 
um, just begun to build the movement. Um, it's about, I think, the work ahead. And, you know, I really mean this. I so accept this award, really, most of all, on behalf of our advocates um, who, you know, talking about changing healthcare is only meaningful if you're doing something about changing healthcare. And from the very first day, uh, you know, at a card table in the clinic waiting room to now in 21 clinics, the advocates do the work of making the work real. Um, and, you know, it's their, um, you know, kind of day in and day out commitment to finding solutions with families that um, I think will compel the rest of the healthcare system to recognize its own potential for impact and the ways that we aspire for it to do. So um, it's just the perfect award for us and we're incredibly proud to be receiving it. Um, and um, I think if anything, when I was reading the list of prior awardees, it was very stressful. <laughs> and, um, and I think at the same time, you know, kind of threw down the gauntlet around what the work is ahead for us. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much to the Center for Public Leadership um, for just celebrating what we've done in this way. We're enormously, enormously grateful for it. So thank you. <laughs>